Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. John, pray for us. It's like we don't even care. You know, it's like, hey, it's just, you know, all right, we like our really trying to make things quality. We're trying to make sure that you stay on her good side so that she chooses your next class. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Huge Careful. question for us, and that is what is happiness? What is happiness? So the first two things that I want you to get out of this or last class was the hierarchy of goods. The hierarchy of goods. Why is that important for us as people trying to make decisions about what's right and wrong and speak about what's right and wrong? What value is there to that idea of the hierarchy of goods? Because it's like places, when you have the hierarchy of goods, you know what you're doing it for the sake of. And so like you go up to like the, like the limitless level versus like just I'm working because I want a better car. I'm working because I want... To look provide good. for my family, which is going to lead them to God. Excellent. And now, what's the value, practically, for you as a person? Because it lets, it knows, it teaches you how to like where you should be putting your efforts. It brings us to like the ultimate telos. Perfect. Yeah. Very good. So like our and ultimate potential. This gives us what I'm looking. You're both right. What I'm looking for though is that this gives us an objective norm for moral judgments. Yeah. I can, thanks to the, the hierarchy of goods, I can now speak of things being better or worse, not just for me, but in themselves. It is better to live for study than it is to live for money. You may choose to live for money. It's not a bad thing. Unless, or, uh, but it is if you choose that as if that was the final end of your life. So now I'm able to dialogue. I haven't mentioned Jesus. I haven't mentioned the Bible. I haven't mentioned God. I'm just looking at it and saying some things are better. And some things are worse. And based upon that, better or worse, I now have a way of saying good and bad. All goods are good. Hierarchy of goods. It's not a hierarchy of goods and bads. The bad comes in <clears throat> when a limited good is loved out of proportion. When a limited good is loved out of proportion. So let's give you an example. Hmm. Let's suppose that happiness is the highest good. Which I think it is. And why is it the highest good? Who can remember the fancy word that he used? The second point I used when I summarized the class just last time? Finality? Yes. It is the highest good because it is the most final of all things. You can't go higher than it because there is nothing higher than it. We haven't said what it is yet. He's going to say what it is. That's what's so awful about him. But if happiness is the highest good, then in order to get happiness, I need a few things. I absolutely have to have money for happiness. You can't not have anything and be happy. Now, there are cases where people are like, you know, they did some sort of movie and they had this on what is happiness. There's some guy, an Indian guy in a shack who's got nothing. He's like, I'm so happy, you know. Well, <laughs> good. I mean, but like, number one, he's extremely rare. And number two, that happiness won't last when his kids get run over by a street machine and he gets cancer or whatever. 
Like, it's a limited, this thing's going to explode. It's a limited happiness because you need, you need to have money. You don't have to have too much, but you have to have the basics. You need to have safety. Again, it's like, I'm in a refugee camp, but I'm really happy. Well, it's because you're in a refugee camp that you're happy. Are you happy when you're, you know, underneath a tree getting chased by, you know, soldiers? No, you're not happy. You need a minimal amount. You also need a lifetime to enjoy it. And you need friends to share it with. You could come up with other, other factors, right? In order for me to have that happiness, well, all of these things, therefore, these aren't the final good, but they are more final than the goods that are underneath them. I mean, gosh, if I have some friends, at least I have something like happiness. When you're dealing with, with depressed people, for example, you're like, just, can you get anything going for you? A gerbil, you know? You're shooting for anything. <laughs> and then they're like, my gerbil, it got stolen from my apartment. And you're like, no, my gosh. There's one calamity after the next. Then my car broke down, and then my jeans ripped when I bent over at the store. And you're just like, oh, there's, like, you know. And so you have to try to pull them up. Something's got to be right here. What you're looking for is something that's final. Because anytime you move up the ladder, you move closer, you participate more in this happiness. Well, then you break this down. Now we're starting to get into the minutia. In order to get money, you have to have a job. And you have to have um, the ability to spend it. It's terrible if you had money and no ability to spend it. I have an inheritance, but I may not touch it. Well, you know. Okay? And you need, you know, whatever else. You need shopping availability. I live in Western Ohio, and I've got $10,000. What am I going to do? How much ice cream can you buy? <laughs> yeah, there's literally nothing you can do with that $10,000. Know? But if, boy, if I had shopping available. Okay. And then you break each of these things down. And each layer that you're going down, you're seeing, you know, so a lifetime to enjoy it. So here you need health. And for health, you need an exercise machine. And to get the exercise machine, you need to be able to have space in your house. You know, you see it's all interconnected. The point is to see these things as levels, as jumps in a hierarchy. And each jump implying a thing of finality, a degree of finality. It's more final, it's more final, it's more final, whatever. Once you're able to speak about this, this idea of finality, it is that for the sake of which I do something, that principle, that for the sake of which, is the principle that allows you to start to make judgments. All of these things are good. Where does badness come? Badness comes when I don't recognize the relationship between this limited good and the one above it. So this can happen in two ways. So I'm going to erase this kind of higher. Well, I guess I don't have to yet. I'll put this in different color, though, to help. So when I live this out of proportion, this happens in two ways. A, it happens when I treat a lesser end as a final end. Or, yeah, as a final end. So if I was like, I live... So as to be able to live long. There's a movie that came out back in the early, late 80s, early 90s called Death Becomes Her. Death Becomes Her. And it's all about people trying to be immortal. And it's, so it's like these two women that want to become immortal. And so they do become immortal, but they hate each other. So their immortality, they can't die as they kill each other over and over again. Now, it's actually a twist on a play by Jean-Paul Sartre called No Exit. Uh, what is it called? Sortie Clos? No Exit is a terror. Do you know the film? Do you know I it? saw like 15 minutes of this film one time, and I was like, what the heck is this? 
<laughs> it's a really depressing film. That's what Jean Paul Sartre does. He's a depressing guy. Remember, he he uh, he didn't commit suicide, but his followers all commit suicide. He hired. He said suicide is the greatest thing a human being can do. So he's actually a pretty wicked mind. And there's lots of young people that are led astray by him continually. But he didn't do it himself. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, why didn't he? Jerk. Because he wanted money. So in any case, Jean Paul Sartre wrote plays, and they were like these satirical plays. He'd be perfect like Saturday Night Live. He would just like destroy things and build nothing. And so he, he has this play where there's two girls and a guy. And there's a sofa, a lamp, a kind of comfortable little setting. And the idea is that they have to live, they get to live forever. Isn't that wonderful? Together. And so what happens is, of course, they start to fight. And the fight goes on forever. So that part of their, the, the horror of his movie is that you're, you can't blink. There's no sleep, there's no blinking. There's this unmitigated truth about each other. So I look at you in all of your horror, terribleness. And so then they fight in their eternity. So it's actually hell. They think that they're in heaven. But their hell is just being in a nice room with two other people forever. Weak clothes, it's called. It's terrible. It sounds horrible. Yeah, no wonder people commit suicide when they read them, you know? But the, the point in, in, of that, and what I'm trying to say about this, is that that idea of that for the sake of which, the problem is when I, I treat a lifetime and enjoy it as if that was the end. That's going to falsify a lot of these things, but never completely. The badness of an act, notice, is hinged on a fundamental goodness. This is key for you guys as you evangelize. This is why people don't respect the, the, the opinion of religious people. Take, for example, people getting drunk with their friends. And then they would say, what's wrong with that? We were together. It's our friends. They're looking at the good. You see? And then you're like, you're all evil and corrupted and twisted and perverted. And they're like, that's not true. Even in the terrible things, the drug environment, there's friendship, there's truth, there's goodness. We're doing this in order to be together. That's like this fundamental thing. So when you recognize that, when you're dealing with someone, talking with someone about a, a depravity or even a problem that they have in their life, you never just say it's all bad. And you never even focus in on the bad, you focus in on the good. So you want to be together, that's totally great. <clears throat> so let's, you guys can be together. The thing is, is that this activity is actually less being together than you could have. Now you're talking a language that enables people to speak to you. It's hinged on a fundamental goodness. But there is a problem, and that is that it's unhinged. The lifetime to enjoy it, gosh, but don't you think you really should have that in safety too? So now you're hinging it to other kind of parallel ends. Wouldn't, don't you think you should do that in a way that other people can share in as well? It's just your little group of friends. How awesome if it be part of a bigger group of friends. See, so it's like, and then eventually you can hinge it also up by saying, you know what, like, it's not going to make you happy. What you're really looking for, I can give you somewhere else by a different approach. What do you guys think? You guys see that? So they mm -hmm. might they might be in their heads chasing happiness, but it's not the best means to get there. Yeah. And what Aristotle would tell you is everybody's chasing happiness even if they don't realize it. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. There's a, that quote uh, by St. Augustine. The young man who knocks at the brothel door knocks there seeking God. like a fundamental attitude of hope and that's what you guys need as you evangelize and what your ministries need as they, as they go out. Dinner is here. Can someone give me a key to the youth house? Yes. Yeah, Hi, Dave. Hello. Hey, Dave, come on in. You're everybody's favorite. <laughs> hey, <laughs> pizza man. I was just telling him that I rave about the pizza all the time. Yeah, There's not pizza tonight. They just told us last night that we, they would pay $40 for one of your pizzas. No. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.
It's just the stuff. Tell Linda we're praying for her. What did you say? Yeah, tell Linda we've been praying for her. Okay, thank you. I'll tell her. Thank you. All right. So, that's, so yeah, the fundamental idea of hope. Remember to hinge it. What you want to do with someone, in other words, when they're doing something bad, is, is open it. You don't have to condemn it. It's a good. Even taking drugs is a good. You're high, not low. You're able to escape your problems. You are with other people, supposedly. You know, The bad part is the addiction, the drug culture, the negativity, and the fact that it's only a mental a feeling high. It's not a real high. So I'd like to really teach you a real high. See? Is there anything that's just, like, inherently bad, always? There are. There are things that are intrinsically evil. So this is not for most of them. There's a thing in morality that we call intrinsic evil. Would you say that everyone's seeking happiness? Yep. I mean, if you're, like, a serial killer, are you really seeking happiness? If you asked him why he did it, and he could give you an answer why, it would be because he's seeking happiness. But serial killers, you kind of wonder, is it like, I don't know serial killers, but like, there is activity where it's not really even human. They're doing it just out of craziness. Yeah. That doesn't count. I mean, if you're like really, truly evil, I mean, I guess maybe in the point where you went down that path, you were seeking happiness, but at a certain point, don't you stop seeking happiness and you're just wrapped up in that? Well, that pride does, in fact is an act of happiness. I'm going to exalt myself. So even self-destruction, oh, like that, I'm going to be a serial killer, I'm going to kill everybody, I hate the world. What you are doing is feeding that yucky, destructive feeling inside of you. And you want to do that because somehow that is good. What about... Um like a depressed person or someone that commits suicide, are they seeking happiness? Because it seems like most of the time they're just attempting not to have to deal with life. I think like, is that really a seeking a happiness? I think so. Mm -hmm. Because even the idea that I'm going to disappear from this world, why? Because somehow at least then there'll be nothing. Yeah, this world's so hard to deal with that they'll be happier not here. Everyone else will be happier. Nobody cares about me. Yeah. So I'll do one good thing. Which is evil. So an intrinsic evil, would that be something like... Suicide is an intrinsic evil. Like sex trafficking and stuff like that. Yeah. There's actually a list that came out in Vatican II where it lists them. Contraception is an intrinsic evil. By intrinsic <laughs> evil, it means that no good can come out of it. So not even with contra contraception, like not even the bonding of the two, because it's kind of limited... The bond that you get with a couple. Well, I mean, they are still seeking happiness, but it would still be. Yeah, I mean, the good, the good, yeah, the good. There can be good that can come from certain aspects of it. So, mm -hmm. like, the fact that two people are together and sharing some sort of emotional intimacy is is true. You can't deny yeah. that. But the use of the contraception okay. itself, yeah, is wrong. That's kind of separate than sex. It, yeah. Yeah. Abortion, sex trafficking, slavery. These are things that are just like, they're not even on the hierarchy of goods. It's not like, well, I could do slavery so that I could then, you know. I mean, once you hit that, you're like at the bottom, you're in a black hole. Wow. And there's a list, the Vatican actually put out a list, it was in, it's in uh, Vatican II, uh, where they said certain things are just condemned outright. And John Paul II added contraception to it. So, like, there are, you know, good, wonderful Christians that use contraception just because. They don't fully understand it. Yep. Um, I mean, they're doing it with good intent as far as, like, I don't know, spacing children or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's still an intrinsic evil. Yeah. What, it, what that means is it doesn't mean that they're evil. It's objectively. It means that that, raw, that that act in their life can't be, like, teleported to something better. So you can, use, you can use it, like, okay, let's suppose contraception. The idea of stopping fertility intentionally makes that act always wrong, universally. It can never be justified by a higher good. Can goods come out of it? Well, yeah, I mean, the spacing of births is a good thing if they need that. 
the whatever else. Sometimes it's for medical things. The woman can't get pregnant or she'll die, you know? So those things are still there, but they're like collateral goods. And the fact is, you can't, you're not allowed to use an intrinsically evil thing for the collateral goods. You've done something that is a wrong in and of itself. Other things are wrong because they're disordered. So like I say, I treat it as a lesser or final end. I just add like point B. It is an intrinsic evil. It's like a whole different like question. <laughs> or point C, I treat it, I treat it, um, or I treat the, so one thing would be overemphasizing and then the other thing would be under, underemphasizing. Underemphasizing. I treat the other things in a too uh, distorted way. I got thrown off my rocker, so my English is bad. But in the line here, intrinsic evil is a whole different category. So you've got one way of looking at morality that's based upon the idea of finality. That's points A and C. And you've got another way that says, well, that's all for things that are good. There are certain activities that are evil. So let's take slavery. Always evil, everywhere evil, no matter what evil. Can goods come out of slavery? Sure they can. Slavery generates money. It generates uh, jobs. <laughs> it, you know, there's like a, a lot of good things the slaves put out there. You know, they got a lot. It, if you look at, for example, the, the uh, uh, Jamaica, island of Jamaica, I don't know if you guys knew this or not. I'm fascinated by this. The power of food. The reason why slaves were wanted in the New World, and especially in Dominican Republic, Haiti, Jamaica, Cuba, uh, that, that part of the world, was because in those lands, you can grow sugar cane. And sugar was the rave in Europe. So they were like, whoever gets sugar gets money. Sugar was like worth more than, I think cinnamon at one point was worth more than gold. So those spices, if I'm a, if I'm a, a young entrepreneur, I'm like, dang, you give me $50,000 and I'll o open a colony that will produce this spice. And in exchange, we'll get all the profits and I'll give you a point back. It was business trade. And so our world, the new world, the reason why it was the, the, the uh, Virginia, the Virginia was owned by the British Trade Company, where it was called the Royal Trade Company is that they were literally just supposed to be plantations producing food, spices, etc., that could go back, and it was all done by money. So the slaves were just taken there because if I could get slave workers, who else is going to harvest sugar cane? It was one of the most difficult crops, the hardest thing. You have to be in the field. You get all cut up and sliced up as you're cutting down these big sheaves. Then you have to crush it, so you have to have horses crushing it in these boil pots that are like so hot as they, as they make all the production by hand. No animals would be willing to do it. So we got human beings that forced them to do it. <laughs> and that's why that whole area of the world is so economically depressed. So you're like, you know, and that's also why there are no native Jamaicans. There's no native, that the original Indians were all killed by disease almost immediately. And what do you have? African American people. They're not African Americans, they're whatever, they're Africans. People of African descent in Brazil and in all those, the, the all Jamaicans, etc. Why is it that they're Africans? Because they're actually literally the children of the slaves that were brought over there. Mm -hmm. And the countries have never recovered because they wiped out absolutely everything and they just planted sugar cane. And it was so that we could get addicted to sugar in Europe. It's like one of the biggest calamities. And this has happened time and time and time again. Eco economy depriving human rights. Okay, but there's lots of good that can come, like sugar. But the, may I entail an evil so that good may come of it? No. And that principle is because these goods all become disordered goods. They all throw the world off because they're out of their foundation. And so there is, there are intrinsically evil things. Prostitution, intrinsically evil. Child abuse, intrinsically evil. Mm -hmm. Slavery, intrinsically evil. Contraception. That makes sense why it's interesting. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you, did, you spaced out the birth, but your marital union is now flawed. Mm -hmm. Right? 
Because like your whole relationship is built on a premise of selfishness. My body is not given to you, but I act like it is. Are we as Catholics like the only people to teach that? Uh, we're, we're, we're right up there. <laughs> like, even like... But you know what's interesting, and this is very fascinating. 1928. Until 1928, every single Christian denomination in the world taught no way ever for contraception. Yeah, I, I read an article on that, yeah. What happened in 1928? The it's Anglican called, or something? Yep, the like, Lambeth Conference which is like their like USCCB. It's like their annual meeting. They meet every year, the leaders of the Anglican Church. Mm-hmm. In 1928, at their conference, they said, okay, here's the deal. It's evil. It's bad. There are some cases where married people really need it for a time. And so, if the priests are around and helping the couple... Could it be for a certain period of time that only married people may use it? Hmm. And they said yes. And they they opened up that door. Contraception. Yeah, I read an article on Teddy Roosevelt, Gandhi, and Sigmund Freud all condemned it, said it's the worst thing for society. <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. Even Freud? Mm-hmm. Freud too. Okay, is there... There was like this weird <clears throat> case apparently like in the 80s or something because it was brought up about a year ago. Pope Francis said something on a plane and everyone freaked out that he said contraceptives was okay. And they related it back to like this case where there was a convent where apparently they had permission to use contraceptives because um, there was like... Gorillas that were going to attack them or something. Yeah, it was something really bizarre. Um, isn't that still wrong? Yes. <laughs> well, when the Pope makes those comments, he's making comments that break with the entire Catholic tradition, which is why he doesn't put them in writing. So. So he's he's. But wasn't seen, that approved at the time? He would. N- I would that? never say Pope Francis has said contraception is okay. Well, he didn't. If you listen to that, that's that the he, whole thing. He take it out of, con- it out take of it out context. context. But uh, like that scenario where it was like, <coughs> I mean, I think it was approved for them to do that. Yeah, the local people may have said that it was approved, and the Pope made a statement that made it sound like it was approved by even like him, but that's not. He never said that. It's you read into what he said and you read it the wrong way. I would just say that he should be a lot more careful about what he says <laughs> and how he says it. Because in the Philippines, he came out and he said something about, you know, we're not called to breed like rabbits. Well, well agreed. But like, what is that? That's exactly the type of phrase that they use to say that we should all be contracepting. Mm-hmm. So it was an ill-chosen Ill phrase, in my opinion. In any case, like, yeah, you're, you know, you're not allowed to ever, period. And there's cases where I've had, you know, as a priest, you get this, I mean, often enough, where the woman's health is, is fragile, her cycle is completely unpredictable. I remember some of them, they're only, like, not fertile, like, four days out of the month. Or if not fertile and not at some stage in the cycle that would preclude sexual activity, four days out of the month. And so it's like, do you really want to take a risk during those periods? Because if I do get pregnant, I will die. So what a lot of priests do is they say, yeah, just use contraception, you're fine. And the answer is no. You yeah. you abstain. And you work on that health. And you bring it back to where it is. And if you can't, then you abstain. And it's just, people, I have to tell you, it, I mean, like, I am celibate. It works. I can, under, I can understand that maybe when you start engaging in sexual activity, you awaken a hunger and an appetite. I have never experienced that. I don't know. I can understand that that could be the case. In any case, the virtue of chastity is to say, I have to be in control of that appetite. It might cause discomfort. But if I don't have the ability to not engage in sexual activity, I am the sick man. Well, I mean, if you're Seriously. in that... If marriage where it's like, well, if we do this, my wife might die, but I want to do it anyhow. Then there's a lot of issues in that marriage. Right. Like, or she like, says something, maybe she wants to do it anyhow, you know. Okay, they, they can take that. They take the, that's the moral, do you take the risk or not? But 
in in that case, the bigger question is exactly that. Like, guys, like, go back. How many priests, how many nuns never do this? How many single people never do this? Like, go back and recapture that. Let that desire kind of yeah. be, be quelled because it's not everything. And then people say, oh, you don't understand. Maybe I do. Maybe you're just not chaste. <laughs> I don't know, but like, you know. We gotta get this thing under control. Because people over-dramatize it. When they act like being celibate is like some sort of terrible cross. It's like, what's going on here? It would be a terrible cross if it stunted your person. <laughs> but celibacy doesn't stunt a person. When it's accepted, it actually frees the person. I'm giving myself as a man in my physicality all over the place all the time by working so hard, by working compassionately with people, by listening. My sexuality is integrated in everything that I am. So like I am being sexual by being, by being alive and working in the world. So when you do that, no, no, the use of your sexual organs, that's the key thing. Like, what kind of weird sexuality is that? That means you're only a man there. <laughs> it's like, you know. Well, plus it's like it degrades the human person almost to this, like, animalistic level because it's like I can't control my passions. Like, I just have to engage because I feel like this right now. Yeah. You got it. <laughs> so those are the arguments that you need to be able to engage. And because they're actually extremely convincing, you notice we don't even talk about Jesus, God. We have an ethically formed mind. And it's based on this. It's really important to get this down. <laughs> because once I'm able to say finality, I've now said objectivity. So now even if the person's like, I really, really, really just want to be safe. I really, really, really. You're able to be like, you're made for more. <laughs> oh, I don't feel like I am. Well, you might not feel it, but objectively you are. You need friends, and you need money, and you need a lifetime. Because all together, they're going to bring you to something you really need. What does point C say up there? I treat the other Okay, so there's two. I was I was Sorry. developing it. I didn't. I didn't <laughs> I, it was a flash. Of, it was a flash of genius, and I got thrown off by the intrinsic evil. So then I tried to recapture it, and I didn't. So let me just have my flash of genius again. Right. Please. <laughs> there's two ways to. There's two ways to misuse something in the hierarchy of goods. The one is to cut it short. Oh, I don't want the other one. The other one is not taking it seriously enough. I treat a good... Uh, without the seriousness it demands. So on the one end, I act like it's my God. It's so funny. For some people, they're way down here in their life. If I have a good job, then I'm everything. I've achieved it. It's like really silly, you know? Um, and then you go lower. You get really low down here. There's some people, they just live for Coca-Cola. I have a Coke every day. I'm good. I go to Starbucks, get my iced tea every day, and then I'm good. Like, you know, oh, Starbucks closed. They're crying. They're protesting, you know? They're way down here in their lives. So that's the first evil. But the second evil is when... I don't act like that is a good. So on the one hand, I overemphasize a lower good, and the other hand, I underemphasize a lower good. And I'm just like, you know what? It's no big deal. Get a job. So I'm going downwards. So either I cap it off, I don't go high enough, or I choose to actually go down. I'm 26, and I play three hours of video games a day. You are a loser. <laughs> no, it's really good. I'm like, no, objectively, you're. I'm happy, dude. Got my family, got my friends, got my video games. You are a loser. You're living down here, and you should be up here. So I've just given you, therefore, three ways to say something is wrong, none of which refer to God, religion, or anything of the Bible. I can speak ethically 
And this, guys, if you were to master those three things, you would be an awesomely equipped evangelizer. You with your artist community, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, no, I think that that painting is wrong. Why? Because it degrades the human person. No, it celebrates it. No, it degrades it. Why? Because it overemphasizes physicality. I think that exhibit where they took all the skin off the people and they just see the muscles and the veins and the body, and they say it's a glorification of the body. Remember that? Have you guys seen that? Mm -hmm. Body yeah, that yeah, I did not go to see it. In high school. Yeah. yeah. Sure. We're all supposed to see it because look at the body. Isn't it amazing? Yeah. It would be possible that that be amazing if the presentation emphasized the beauty of the human person. If it's just, though, let's look at physicality, then actually it could be degrading. Is there a way that they could have done that to emphasize? So like how they got the bodies and stuff was kind of, I mean, all like it sounded really cool, but they just went and dug up like home. Yeah, it was like people with unmarked graves. So what it was like very you, like? disrespectful of like. I thought that all the actually, bodies were donated. No, they just like. Are you sure? Because I'm pretty sure that's what the ladies was telling me. Because I went and saw it too, that and they was were telling part of the controversy around it. Well, because like there was like athletes, graves. there was like Olympic athletes and stuff that donated their bodies to science. Maybe some of put. them, but a lot of them, they just went oh. and dug up like unmarked graves where there was like no one to. Wrong. Just wrong. Just wrong. That is wrong. Because, because I'm yeah. saying that because like yeah. a higher thing is the soul and the person's dignity than the use of your art, the use of their body. <laughs> but then people might see that as like, well, we're doing, we're honoring them by like, you know, now they're, they're um, a piece of art or something, or like, you know, they're educating all of these kids, or however they see that, they're like, we're doing a good for them, so like, really, we're honoring them. I mean, how do you? I would say, if you ever want to know how to honor me, ask me first, because. <laughs> I will tell you that ripping off all of my skin and exposing my body parts to the general viewing of the public is not honoring me. Mm -hmm. No, but it's done very respectfully, according to you. Yeah. But objectively, the skin is supposed to stay on the body, not come off it. So objectively, now I'm saying that because like I have this idea. I've got a moral, ethical framework. So these judgments are very complex. I haven't given you enough tools to get to those judgments based on these tools. All I want to accomplish with you is that you see that there's a tool. The hierarchy of goods gives me a way of speaking objectively. And it's rooted on its principle of finality. Which is that second principle from yesterday's class. I don't know. What was that? I thought they filmed with plastic and stuff so they last. Oh. That's, okay, I know I they fill the veins. I know they fill all the veins with plastic so that the finality. plaster. Muscles on A thing is done for its own sake and for the sake of nothing else. So your example of, well, education of children, that's, that's the reason why that's a good argument is because it has a weight, a stamp of finality. Look at how high that is to educate children. Surely that's higher than the respect of the body. And I would argue, if I was in front of that person arguing with me, I would say, if you use the disrespect of the body in order to educate children, you have undermined the reason why you're educating them, which is to respect the body. So, and, but usually you never get to that level of argument. People are just dumb. <laughs> and they don't think. But you... <coughs> okay, got this? Got it. Uh, thing is done for its own sake and for... The sake of nothing else. That is when it's totally final. But everything except the one good is halfway final, partially final. <laughs> but increasingly final. Higher education of children. Noble, noble. Is there anything more noble? Yes, respecting the human person. <laughs> more noble. So that's, that's only, he did all of that thinking, guys, in just those four paragraphs that you read. It's pretty, pretty valuable stuff. Let's take a look then at the next push on. What then is this happiness? Using these principles, he makes a general claim. But now he needs to get serious and tell us, well, what exactly does it mean? Because for most of us, we're thinking happiness is a feeling. Let's make a little list. 
How would you define happiness? Bree? Um, you like all this group work? I hope it's helping you guys. I love it. Hope you're learning so much more. It's just killing me. Bree, tell us how you define <laughs> happiness. Uh, union with God. Okay. What does that mean? It means to be in total relationship with Him, to share in His goodness. Um, How do you do that? By conforming to His will. How do you do that? By following His commandments. So happiness is following His commandments? Um, like what do you do to be happy? You make a choice. Talk to me. It's. I mean, like I make a choice. I make all kinds of choices. You make a choice out of your free will to do good um, in the highest form. In its highest. To do good. So you've gone from <laughs> union with God to doing good. <laughs> <laughs> Concretely, happiness for Bree is. Freely choosing to do good. Okay, what types of doing of good would you say are the kinds? Because I can do good by drinking wine well. I can do good by playing the piano well. What, is the, what do you do when to be happy? Um, you choose to be selfless in every action. Selfless... So, you always have the, um... Should we put selflessly loving? Yes. Sure. No? That's not that it's my word, not yours. Sure. I mean, you yeah. You said no, selflessly that's, that's living, true. but I'm not no, trying to like you. No, it's you. loving. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, isn't that love? Is there any other type of doing good? You're like, if you do this, this is happiness. You're like, if you live, love selflessly, you will be in union with God, and you will be happy. Is that Bree's philosophy of life? It's accurate. Regina. Philosophy of happiness. Um. <laughs> what is happiness? Happiness is it's like a peace within yourself um, when you're satisfied, when you when you are happy with the the different hierarchies and the hierarchies of like you know you're satisfied with your job. Um, you're achieving what it's intended to do, mm -hmm. um, and when you you know when you don't when you have a a job uh, that you like doing, like all of those things play in to that peace, mm -hmm. which is where you're ultimately going to be happy. Um, I would you say that say, sums it up. Yeah, because I think that happiness is like a different level than like joy. So I would, I would actually say like union with God, it's not necessarily going to guarantee happiness. I mean, if you're like Saint Peter and you're being crucified upside down on the cross, I mean, you might have joy with that union in God, um, but I don't think I would define that as happiness. So it's more of a when you're at peace. Okay, I agree with that statement, but based on you, uh, the teaching that um, happiness being the highest good, so are we talking of happiness as a feeling or happiness as... Um, We're defining happiness. We're looking yeah. just for how you approach it. Okay. So you, Bree, are, are you approached it by this, which doesn't mean anything. Until we got to here. You are like, happiness is li loving selflessly. And then, 
Bree or Regina hasn't given me what to do to get there yet, but she says when you are at peace.